Thank you directly to Queen's Park right now, where the Ontario Attorney General is discussing a report on the province's response to the pandemic. Let's listen. I'd like to further acknowledge Wendy Kumbo for her excellent work during her almost 24-year career with the office. Wendy postponed her retirement to complete Chapter 1 of this special report for the members of the legislature. And Wendy's to my left there. The COVID-19 pandemic presents a challenge to health experts and government decision makers around the world that in many ways is unprecedented in its impact and complexity. Decision makers, the healthcare system, and the public all made a determined effort to ensure that Ontario's health system would not be overrun in the first wave. Ontario and Quebec were the two provinces hardest hit by the first wave. We can be grateful that the worst case scenarios initially anticipated did not materialize. Ontario would have been much better prepared to address the challenges of COVID-19 had it addressed many of the recommendations in past reports from the SARS Commission, from our office and from others. Overall, we found that Ontario's response to COVID-19 in the winter and spring of 2020 was slower and more reactive relative to other provinces. We also found that the Ministry of Health did not have available, when COVID-19 impacted Ontario, coordinated and effective systems and procedures in place that could be relied upon and easily be adjusted to perform timely COVID-19 lab testing, case management, and contact tracing. Improvements continue to be needed in these areas to control and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Long-standing systemic issues, such as outdated and largely untested emergency management and pandemic response plans, limited lab surge capacity, deficient lab and public health information systems, a fragmented public health system, along with a health command structure not fully led by the chief medical officer or dominated by public health expertise, complicated Ontario's response to COVID-19. In our audit emergency management in Ontario pandemic responses, we found that the province was clearly not adequately prepared and trained for an emergency of this magnitude. We brought this state of unpreparedness to its attention in our 2017 audit on emergency management in Ontario. However, we found that in the past three years, only 4 or 11% of the 36 recommended actions that the Ministry of the Solicitor General was responsible for have been implemented. The Ministry oversees the Provincial Emergency Management Office, the EMO, is to lead province-wide non-health-related emergency and or pandemic responses. EMO is responsible for the Provincial Emergency Response Plan for Ontario, while the Ministry of Health is responsible for the health-related response plans. With COVID-19 impacts beyond the health response of leading critically important public health measures, EMO would normally coordinate the many other aspects of emergency response, such as ensuring that municipalities are immediately informed of actions to be taken and relations with the federal government. When COVID-19 hit Ontario, the province was not in a position to activate the provincial response structure in its emergency response plan. This was partly due to having outdated emergency response plans dating back to 2013 for the Ministry of Health and 2006 for EMO and a lack of sufficient staff and, government, um, staff and government and oversight processes for emergency man management. Instead, on March 25, 2020, the province hired an external consultant to create a new governance structure after Ontario declared a state of emergency on March 17. The consultant's final report was delivered on April 24, 2020. In contrast to Ontario, other provinces were able to activate existing response structures and had updated emergency response plans. The new governance structure did not give EMO a prominent role. Our audit on outbreak planning and decision making found that Ontario's response to the pandemic has been hampered by a cumbersome command and advisory structure. On February 28th, the Ministry of Health established a health command table to provide advice to the Minister of Health Cabinet and the Premier regarding Ontario's COVID-19 response. The health command table grew larger and more complex over time, starting from 21 members with no subtables, then expanding to 83 participants consisting of 32 members and 51 attendees as of August 31st. 
plus 25 subtables. In total, more than 500 people are involved in the health command tables. This structure should have been dominated by public health experts, but was not. We found that Public Health Ontario's expertise was not always sought. Regional tables were generally led by hospital CEOs and staff from Ontario Health, not public health experts. The structure is vastly larger than the structures used by other jurisdictions, which have, been better, um, have made better decisions faster in areas such as testing and long-term care. We also found that the Chief Medical Officer of Health was identified as a co-chair of the health command table on March 6th, but the terms of reference were not updated to reflect this and he did not chair any of the meetings. The lessons learned from SARS were to act quickly to put precautionary measures in place, but we found there were delays. Such delays included alerting Ontarians to avoid unnecessary travel, acknowledging community transmission, and requiring long-term care homes to take precautionary actions. As the pandemic progressed, it became evident that it is critical to identify individuals with COVID-19 on a timely basis through lab testing, case management, and contact tracing in order to prevent them from spreading COVID-19 to others. Our audit on lab testing, case management, and contact tracing found that the Ministry of Health did not take immediate actions to ramp up testing capacity, despite warnings by Public Health Ontario and experts in February 2020. It was not until a month later in March that testing capacity was increased with assistance from community and hospital labs. Despite this, the ministry felt short of its own targets for lab testing. 60% of lab tests were to be collected within one day of specimen collection, completed within one day of specimen collection, and 80% within two days of specimen collection. However, the province overall has not met these targets. Only about 45% of tests were completed within one day, and 77% of tests were completed within two days between March and August 2020. The regions that fell behind in lab testing included the hotspots of Toronto, Peel Region, and York Region. We also determined that as of March 31, 2020, possibly 119,000 Ontarians who might have had COVID-19 were never tested, partly because the province was not able to test anyone with symptoms who requested a test until mid-May. Our audit found that Public Health Ontario informed the Ministry of Health in 2017 of the risk of its inability to comprehensively respond to emerging public health threats due to a lack of sustained funding. However, the Ministry reduced Public Health Ontario's funding by about 13 million or 9% in 1920. Between 1415 and 1920, Public Health Ontario decreased its numbers of full-time equivalent staff by 120, representing 12% of its workforce. Several important thinkers have pointed out over the years that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In closing, on behalf of my office, I want to thank the many people involved in our work for their assistance and cooperation in the completion of this special report. Finally, I want to thank those in the healthcare sector and the various subject matter experts, including Dr. David Walker and others who shared their knowledge and advice with us. In particular, we also want to thank the frontline healthcare workers and lab technicians. Now I'd be happy to take your questions.